All right, well, let's, we got about 10 seconds here. Does everybody hear me okay? Is it too loud? Good? All right, hopefully I don't blast anybody's eardrums. Well, here we are right at 9 o'clock. We'll give it a second for the green. Maybe. Maybe. That's blinky. There we go. All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, day two of the Southeast Linux Fest. My name is Adam Kennedy. I am a network engineer manager at Tire Rack. So a little bit about me. Um, I started with Slackware in 1994, so I am very old. Uh, I, am a senior, I was a senior system admin and an ISP for a while. Uh, I'm now a senior systems engineer and team manager at Tire Rack. I use TrueNAS Core at home for VMs, my home lab, a uh, bunch of stuff, you know, storing Linux ISOs, um, backups, general, just stuff uh, since about 2004. And I've spent, honestly, roughly about a so an hour of social anxiety time trying to figure out, should I include something that talks about me or not? So we'll just keep going past this slide and uh, ignore that that happened. So anybody that's been on the TrueNAS forums, uh, you're trying to just divulge as much information as you can, just take in everything you possibly can from those forums. And sometimes you come across these guys and you're like, how do they know so much? There's just so much that dumps into TrueNAS. There's so many topics. There's so many little nuances. There's so many things. How do they know what they know? Uh, and when I started with TrueNAS, I swear to you, I thought that the flying spaghetti monster just bestowed all of the TrueNAS knowledge to these guys because it seemed like any question you ask them, they would go into a dissertation that was multi-paragraphs long on why you should do something, why you shouldn't, or how to do it differently. Um, I can attest to that, that the FSM does not extend his noodley appendage and bestow the knowledge upon you. You just learn it by doing it or trial and error. So my storage at home, uh, I have a, there's a weird wrinkle in the thing. Uh, <laughs> my storage at home, I've got two shelves down here towards the bottom. Uh, I run TrueNAS Core. I have 22 uh, 3.8 terabyte SSDs, uh, 10 gig Ethernet connecting everything. I have another IBM JBOD shelf there at the bottom uh, that has another 12 disks in it and SAS connected between the two uh, for the actual data. So that's more of just a hey, look, you can do stuff. Uh, this is some of the installations that I have done um, using IX Systems TrueNAS units. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic. Uh, what's really cool is that TrueNAS is open source and free. So you don't have to utilize their exact hardware. You can roll it on your own hardware. Um, the boxes above on the left side and below are super micro chassis. Uh, those are just generic Intel boxes running TrueNAS. Uh, as long as you get the hardware that has compatible with the software, you're good to go. And that's a pretty wide range of hardware. So just the back side of those on the left and uh, just some basic network nerd pictures there uh, showing how they connect to the rest of the network on the right side. Huh? Thank you. That took a while. And every cable is labeled on both sides. Where it comes to and goes from, or goes to and comes from. So, what is TrueNAS? Uh, TrueNAS Core is, like I said, it's a free and open source network attached storage OS. Uh, it's based on FreeBSD and the OpenZFS file system. Uh, TrueNAS can be installed on a variety of different hardware. It supports replication to another TrueNAS system. Uh, you can also sync data to cloud services. So, if you have Google Drive or Backblaze or uh, I think it supports Amazon AWS or uh, the S3 storage as well. There's a whole variety of different things. Uh, if anybody knows the R clone system, you know, the R clone tools, it's basically using that. Uh, you can synchronize to pretty much anything that R clone supports. Uh, it also has a mini hypervisor. So TrueNAS Core has the Beehive hypervisor built in. Uh, TrueNAS Scale uh, is native KVM. So what is ZFS? ZFS is the Z file system. Uh, it was actually created in 2001 to be the next gen file system for Open Solaris. It utilizes what's called copy on write. So anytime that you save data, it doesn't actually overwrite 
the sectors of data that exist, it copies that to a new section on the disk and writes to that new section. The reason it does that is that you don't want your current data to be accidentally garbled. If something happens in that write process, your existing data is perfectly fine. It will just stop writing the new data and defaults back to what's already actually committed to the disk. Uh, the maximum file size is 16 exabytes, so don't go over that. It has native snapshot capability, uh, so if you're familiar with snapshots on pretty much any other file system, you'll be familiar with this. The pool config is written to each disk that's in uh, the actual pool. So, uh, what's awesome about that is most RAID arrays, you have to put the disk back in the exact slot, the exact port that it was connected to before. Uh, with TrueNAS, you don't have to do that. I have literally taken, in the shelves that you saw before, I've taken every disk out, put them into a box, carry it to a data center, and just randomly placed them into the shelf afterwards, and it works perfectly fine. TrueNAS will pick up exactly which disk is where and just runs with it. It doesn't care which port they've been plugged into. Uh, it has something called ARC. Um, I had some presenter notes on what exactly that acronym was, but they're not showing up. Uh, let me see if I can get those real quick. There we go. Um, <laughs> I didn't put it on that slide. Anyway, uh, it's something read cache. Adaptive. Adaptive read cache. Uh, so this provides a absolutely massive read cache. Uh, the limits to ARC are literally your memory. How much, however much RAM you shove into the machine, a portion of that becomes the read cache. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Uh, and it is what they call self-healing. Uh, it avoids bit rot with pool scrubbing. So if you're not familiar with bit rot, if you throw a couple of JPEGs onto a hard drive, you kind of leave it in the closet for a while, you bring it back out after a few years, and you try to read those uh, files, sometimes you'll notice that the files will read, but they're a little garbled at the bottom, or there might be some pixels missing periodically. That's actually bit rot. So when you're pulling the data back off the disks, there may be a couple of bits, literally the little tiny bits on the drive will flip from north to south, so the, the, that's a bit flip. So it's changing from zero to one or whatever. Um, and the reason that it can avoid that is ZFS has what's called pool scrubbing. So it will look at all of the data and read all of the data that's on your pool and verifies it with the, um, the parity hashes that it has on the disk. And if anything seems awry, it does a copy on write to repair that so that way you don't lose any data due to bit flipping. So let's talk about a couple of terms here with ZFS. Um, if you're familiar with traditional RAID arrays, uh, a pool is, called an, is traditionally called an array. A VDEV uh, is a RAID group or a subset. So you have you know, maybe two disks in a subset, another two disks in a subset, and that creates the array. Um, those individual sets of disks are called VDEVs. There's a ZIL or a S-log or SLOG. Uh, that is your write cache. And ZIL stands for the ZFS Intent Log, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the ARC or uh, L2 ARC is the read cache. We have a data set, which is just a folder. That one throws a, a lot of people, so don't, <laughs> don't let it confuse you or, or intimidate you. It's just a folder. Uh, and then you have a ZVOL, which is a block storage uh, mechanism in ZFS. So here's kind of a demonstration. Uh, uh, illustration of what the pools can look like. Uh, we've got three disks on the left side, that creates a VDEV. Three disks on the right side, that creates another VDEV. And those two VDEVs come together to create the actual pool. Uh, in this case, there's three disks in a RAID Z1 configuration. Uh, that'll make more sense here in a few minutes. And they create two VDEVs, um, and we'll stripe across the two. Traditional RAID sets, uh, you have one or more disks set aside as a parity drive. Uh, RAID Z can take the size of one of those disks and basically breaks it up across all of the drives. So with uh, traditional RAID, that one parity disk just does parity, like it doesn't really do anything else. With RAID Z, it can utilize all of the drives all at once, and it takes the data that you're writing and chunks it up so that it writes it out evenly across all the drives, including a parity bit uh, or a parity data block and, and writes it. 
A Z pool uh, uh, rebuild uh, is called a resilver. Uh, again, just another strange little term. Uh, but it can take hours or days depending on the size of your pool. Uh, and that's pretty much one of the things that people want to make sure you take into consideration when you're creating a pool um, with, with ZFS. So pool layouts. Traditional RAID types, uh, we have RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 10, RAID 50, um, a bunch of others. Uh, RAID 6 is, is another popular one. Uh, so just to refresh everybody's memories, RAID 0 is, uh, let's say we have eight disks. Uh, we might create one VDEV or just one flat you know, array. Uh, your IOPS is going to be one drive on read, because it has to read all the disks to get you the data that you're looking for. Uh, but writing uh, basically takes advantage of the speed of eight drives, because it's only writing the speed, you know, one chunk to, to each of the, the disks. There's no redundancy, and it makes a very large pool. So if you want the absolute maximum storage you possibly can, you create a RAID 0 at the sacrifice of redundancy. RAID 1 uh, gives you, again, let's say eight drives and one VDEV. Uh, the read IOPS would come from eight disks. The write IOPS is one disk because uh, everything's mirrored. So you're writing to one drive. All the data gets written to one disk, and then it gets mirrored to whatever is uh, attached or whatever else in that RAID 1. It gives you really good redundancy. Uh, it is a faster read, not so much on the writes. With RAID 10, it kind of combines those two. So it, again, with eight disks, let's say we're going to put them into four VDEVs. So it's going to be two disks per VDEV. Uh, that's going to give you eight drives of read uh, IOP speed and four drives of write. Uh, this is kind of a nice happy medium. Uh, this is what most enterprises are using for VM storage or anything else that they need, you know, the most performance possible with some redundancy. Uh, so this is going to give you fast reads, fast writes, marginal redundancy, uh, and it's mainly used for, like I said, VMs, databases, things that just have to be performance intensive. So let's talk about RAID-Z. Uh, RAID-Z is the RAID type that ZFS kind of leans on. Um, it's where it gets a lot of its interesting power from. So the way to read this is you have RAID-Z1, RAID-Z2, and uh, there's actually a RAID-Z3 I didn't put on the slide. Uh, but the number after the Z just indicates how many disks worth of space is going to be redundant. So that, that's going to be your parity disks. So in a RAID Z1 pool, it's going to have one drive equivalent as the parity, RAID Z2, two drive equivalent, and so on. Uh, so again, let's say you have eight disks. You put them in one VDEV. Uh, very similar. You're going to have seven drives for the read, one drive for the write for IOPS performance. Um, most folks will do RAID Z2 or RAID Z3. Uh, if you read the forums and you talk about doing a RAID Z1, you will probably get yelled at by one very specific community member. Uh, he is extremely anti-RAID Z1, and for kind of good reasons. Um, with spinning traditional disks, you know, traditional rust, as, as most folks call it, if there is a problem during your resilver process, uh, you could have another drive fail out. And if you have another drive fail out while you're rebuilding, you've just lost your entire array. And that's not something that you want to have happen you know, with any array. So having two parity disks is usually a really good idea, especially if you get into multi-terabyte drives. Uh, when you start talking about you know, two, three, four terabyte disks, you can usually rebuild that array fairly quickly, and your chance for failure on another disk is pretty slim. Uh, but as you get into the higher capacity disks, you know, a lot of people are doing 12, 14, 22 terabyte disks. Uh, the time it takes to rebuild that data is long. It takes a long time to rebuild. While it's doing that, all of your disks are getting really hot, and they're running all the time because they are reading, they're writing, they are constantly doing something in addition to your normal data. So if you have a lot of virtual machines that are using that pool and you're doing a resilver at the same time, you're maxing the performance of that disk as much as possible. So that thing is just going to be working as hard as it possibly can, and that's what causes additional disk failure. So definitely make sure if you have a large sized array, 
at least RAID Z2. Uh, if you are really can't afford to lose any of your data, I'd go RAID Z3. Yeah. So let's talk about ZFS caching for a bit. Uh, so why do you need so much RAM for TrueNAS? Uh, and how much RAM you actually need is a bit of a hotly discussed topic on the forums. TrueNAS as an operating system needs about 8 gig of RAM to just run and function pretty well. You can run it with less memory, but you're going to have some weird slowness and some other issues if you try to run you know, a couple services, if you're running NFS and Samba and a few other things. It's going to take up base operating system memory pretty quickly. Uh, so they say a minimum of 8 gig uh, for the operating system itself. Anything above that 8 gig goes to the ARC. So anything the operating system is not using is not wasted RAM. It actually utilizes that for your read cache. That's where I put the, <laughs> the description. So the ARC will fill up normally and expire lesser used items. So the way that that functions is um, every time you read something off the pool, it's going to throw it, if you read it multiple times, it's going to start throwing that into your ARC. That way, instead of reading from the disks every time you need that data, it reads it from memory. So it's very fast, and it's an immediate response. So you're not sitting there waiting on the same thing to come back up every single time from the pool. It strives to hit, or you want to strive to hit as many cache hits as possible. Uh, there is a performance counter in ZFS and in TrueNAS that you can see how much is coming from that arc, uh, and it's generally slow when it first starts because it, it has to build what's in that cache. So as you utilize uh, that, that system, you will see the arc hits go from you know, probably 0% when you first start out to you know, a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, depending on how much data you use uh, on your disks and how random or consistent it is. Uh, it will eventually fill up that arc, and you will start to see your, hopefully, start to see your arc hits at you know 50 percent 80 percent etc you really want that to be as high as possible uh, but again it's completely dependent on how much data and what kind of data you're pulling from the disks if you're using completely random data every time you're probably not going to see too many arc hits uh, but as you read more of the same data it will start to fill that up so the way that it sends uh, data to what's called an l2 arc is as you utilize items that are in the arc, um, it will keep refreshing. So everything, let's say you load the same file 10 times, you load another file a couple of times, it's going to keep those kind of at the top of the list. If that item that you use 10 times, you start to not use very much, it's going to start moving down lower and lower in the list in the arc. And so it gets pushed down to the bottom of that arc list. When it gets near the bottom, if you have an L2 arc, TrueNAS will say, you know what, that's going to need to be dumped off to this L2 arc. It will actually move that to the L2 arc and then freeze up that space on your regular arc. Uh, most folks ask, do I need an L2 arc? 99% of the time, the answer is no. Uh, you really don't need an L2 arc. If you think you need an L2 arc, uh, I would just... Go without it. You can always add one later, and there are tools to tell you whether or not you could utilize and benefit from an L2 arc. Um, I wouldn't spend the money on an L2 arc personally. I would just wait. Whatever money you were going to spend on that, as uh, usually an L2 arc is on an SSD. Whatever money you were going to spend on that SSD, I would spend on storage for your primary pool, or just save it in the bank for something else. Yep, I would. Definitely spend it on as much memory as you possibly can. Another question that comes up a lot is, do I need a ZIL or an S-Log or SLOG? Um, the answer is maybe. So the way that this functions, uh, hopefully this everybody can see this uh, diagram. So as writes occur to the pool, uh, you're basically minimized by the speed of those spinning drives. So if you've got 7200 RPM disks, which is mostly what everybody's going to, because that's where you can get to find the really large drives, um, and 10K and 15K disks are uh, pretty spendy. So that drive write is going to be limited to the IOPS of 
how many disks are being uh, in your pool that you can VDEV and, and stripe across, as well as how fast can the disk actually spin. A way to circumvent that is to throw in a ZIL uh, or an S-log. So you can put that on an, a separate SSD, and anytime you make a disk write, it actually dumps it to that SSD first. Then, after five seconds, all the data on that SSD gets dumped to the actual spinning drives. This gives you an enormous performance increase on your writing speeds. Um, chances are you probably do want a ZIL, especially if you're using something like NFS with VMware. Uh, NFS on VMware specifically is synchronous write. Uh, that is something that not a lot of people know. Uh, it seems to come up quite a bit everywhere I've seen on forums. Uh, people get terrible write speeds on VMware. You find out they're using NFS. Guaranteed, that's where your issue is. Um, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous writes, for those that, that don't know, uh, synchronous writes are as soon as VMware calls for a write, it waits for the file system to say, yep, data's been written to the disk, everything is good to go, that was successful, and then it moves on to the next write process. So if you're waiting for that spinning disk to write out all of the, all of the data, ZFS will, or uh, TrueNAS will actually wait for the write to be completed and say that it's successful before it reports back to VMware, yep, you're good to go. So if you can have that written out to an SSD, TrueNAS will report back, hey, the data's on the SSD, we're good, and then tells VMware, yeah, keep writing. Uh, it's not perfect. I would still go with some kind of asynchronous file system to VMware like iSCSI. Uh, but if you do want to use NFS, definitely use a ZIL. It will improve your performance. Sometimes with Samba, um, it requires uh, synchronous writes as well. Um, not too often. Um, some combinations of like time machine backups and things like that like to have synchronous writes. So if you are using that, uh, again, with Samba, the ZIL may improve it. And if you're not sure if you need one, you can always check uh, ZIL stat. So a ZIL exists even without a separate SSD. The reason for the kind of the confusion between ZIL and, and S-Log is a ZIL exists all the time. The ZFS intent log, if you don't have a separate SSD, resides on the pool that you've created. So that's also part of why it's slow, because ZFS natively, TrueNAS natively, writes that data to the ZIL first, and then it gets dumped out to the actual disks. So if it's written to the ZIL, and that ZIL's on your spinning disks, and then it has to turn around and read from the spinning disks to write back to the same spinning disks, that's causing a lot of that performance problem. So as soon as you put a separate SSD in the pool, that's when it becomes the S-log name, uh, and the ZIL moves to that separate log and then increases your performance. And again, it's every five seconds, so you don't have to buy a huge SSD. Uh, you basically, the, the math, the way it works out is you need to take a look at how much data you're writing to your pool and figure out every five seconds how much are you writing. That size, or maybe two or three times that size, is what you actually should aim for for an SSD. So for most folks, something small like a 120 gig or 160 gig SSD, perfectly fine. You don't have to go anything crazy high. So pool design. Um, this is another very hotly contested topic on which one you feel is best. Um, I personally went through probably two or three different iterations of my personal pool of just designing it, breaking it, throwing data onto it, pulling drives out, crying a little bit because I forgot to do a backup, always do a backup, uh, and then rebuilding the pool again and starting over. I did that probably a dozen times of just messing with TrueNAS and trying to figure out what pool is the best option for me and my use case. So to help you with a little bit of that and not go completely crazy over <laughs> which pool design is, is best, um, most folks will benefit from a RAID Z2 or RAID Z3. Uh, again, if you need absolute fastest performance possible, just go straight to a RAID 10. If it's data that you don't need a ton of performance, um, like I said, Z2 or, or Z3 will, will work out just fine. 
Uh, with that RAID 10, uh, I would recommend two disk wide VDEVs. There is a caution, however, if you're doing RAID 10 with two disk wide VDEVs, each VDEV is your parity set. So that's basically going to cause one disk in that VDEV is, you know, your, your right or one, vat, one size of that disk is your right, the other one's your parity. So you can lose one drive per VDEV if you set it up with two uh, before you lose that entire VDEV. And the very important thing to remember is that losing any one VDEV in your pool destroys the pool. Is what, the way that ZFS does this uh, is each VDEV, if you have you know, two VDEVs, it's striping across those VDEVs. So of course in a stripe, you lose any disk in a stripe, your data's gone. So according to TrueNAS, one VDEV is basically a disk. So if you lose one VDEV, your data's completely gone. So just take that into consideration if you're doing a, a RAID 10. You can add multiple mirror drives, um, at least on ZFS and, and TrueNAS, you can add multiple RAID drives. So you can do a three disk wide VDEV in RAID 10 and it gives you a little extra buffer there for, uh, for security and redundancy. The general recommendation is three to nine disks per VDEV. Um, I've seen some really high recommendations on that. Uh, this three to nine disks per VDEV actually comes from IX Systems. Um, I trust them with my data. I'd recommend you trust them with your data as well. And three to nine disks per VDEV is kind of that nice point between performance and reliability that anything beyond that you really don't see a much of an uh, performance gain. It's better to just separate the disks up into multiple VDEVs where you'll see much better performance uh, at maybe the sacrifice of a little bit of storage, but uh, again, depends on your use case. Uh, the specific disk numbers per RAID Z, um, it's less of an issue with LZ4 compression. Uh, by default, TrueNAS enables LZ4 compression, so every bit of data that's written to your disks is going to be compressed. And the reason that's less of an issue is LZ4 is very fast. Most CPUs can process LZ4 compression without even really thinking about it. Um, I mean, it's their job to think about it, but they'll do it very, very quickly. You really won't notice any kind of a performance hit by enabling LZ4 compression. Uh, I know a, a lot of old school folks like me, you hear compression and RAID array and you wince quite a bit because it, to all this old CPUs, it just annihilated the CPUs. And all of that compression was done on the RAID controller. That really caused a lot of problems because they just didn't have very fast CPUs. They weren't designed for it. So definitely involve uh, and include LZ4 into your plans. Um, you're not going to see a performance hit with it and it's just going to give you more space. So. Don't be afraid to enable it. Uh, again, be mindful of the number of drives in each VDEV. Kind of stick to that recommendation of three to nine disks. And pool upgrades, uh, you can always add a VDEV as long as it's the with TrueNAS, as long as it's the same size and type of VDEV as the rest in your pool, you cannot remove a VDEV. Uh, I made the mistake once of creating a RAID Z2 pool of all of my drives. I had six disks, and I think they were eight terabytes at the time, and I wanted to upgrade and have more storage in my pool. So as I found out, I can add a VDEV of another eight drives, or another six disks. So I did. Found another set of drives, passed them in, and then I decided later on, I want this to be a different type of pool, you can't remove one of the VDEVs and then redesign the pool and put the data back on. Once it's in the pool, it's in the pool. You cannot remove it. You have to destroy the pool and recreate in order to resize any of that. Uh, so some systems back in the day would let you easily change from like RAID 5 to RAID 6, or you could sometimes, some systems, if you had enough data, they would allow you to kind of reconfigure that to a different RAID type. Um, not so much with, with TrueNAS and ZFS. You, you really need to kind of take a little bit of thought, do some math. Um, I would really highly recommend a, there, there's a ton of websites that have a ZFS pool calculator where you can put in, I have this many disks, that's this much a size, I want to go for RAID Z2. And it will tell you, okay, how many VDEVs do you want? 
you define that and then it will tell you what your ending size is uh, for your pool. Play around with that before you commit to a design and you'll be much, much happier. Uh, pool upgrades can replace existing disks. So let's say you have six drives, you have eight terabyte disks, and you want to upgrade to 10 terabyte drives. Uh, the old school method with old RAID arrays was that you had to pull a disk, insert the new disk, let the array rebuild, rinse and repeat, waste a week of your life waiting for this thing to fully upgrade all of the drives. With, with TrueNAS, you can have, if you have a spare connector on the, on the uh, uh, controller, you can pop the new disk into that spare port, go into TrueNAS, tell it, replace this disk with the new one I inserted. It will do the resilver to the new drive, replacing that old one. When it's done, you can safely pull the old drive without having any kind of a hiccup on your reliability or redundancy. So I highly recommend doing that. Uh, because by pulling that disk, you are putting your pool into a, 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 a non-redundant state. Yeah. So definitely rebuild with everything online just to make sure you're not putting yourself into a, a cautionary state. So some hardware guidelines. Uh, you can do this on a Raspberry Pi. I don't recommend it. You can also do it as a virtual machine. I don't recommend it. Um, a lot of folks, you just need a spare 64-bit Intel CPU laying around. Uh, I like E3 for low power, just because I'm not made of money. Uh, I do have a power bill, and that will play into, uh, into your budget. ECC registered RAM is highly, highly recommended. You can use standard RAM, uh, but the reason for ECC is, again, if there's any kind of solar flares, alien invasion, whatever... ECC RAM is going to be scrubbed and it's going to check to make sure the data that's utilized in RAM, so your ARC cache and all of the OS, the data that's in transit, all of that is nice and safe when it gets to the, to the actual disks. A plain disk controller. You do not want a RAID controller that has you know, an LBA mode or an HBA mode. It does need to be a tried and true, plain, basic, nothing special disk controller. Uh, I prefer the LSI branded controllers. Uh, the 3000 series or the 2000 series in what they call IT mode uh, work perfectly fine. If they are in IR mode, which is their traditional RAID mode, most of them have a firmware flash that you can apply that puts them into IT mode. Um, just go with the one that has the number of ports that you need for your drives and fits within your budget. Uh, you can find them on eBay, most places. Uh, there's probably 400 in my basement. So um, if you need one, <laughs> just look around. Somebody's got one. Uh, but usually on eBay, they're like the 2000 series, you can pick them up for like 50 bucks. They're, they're really not too bad. Uh, again, you need about 8 gig of RAM minimum. Uh, really recommended is 16 terabytes or more. Or six, 16, that would be a lot of RAM, RAM memory. 16 gigabytes or more. Uh, my personal preference is 32. Again, the more RAM you have above that 8, it all goes to your read cache. You want a 16 gig or higher SSD for boot. Uh, mainly, again, 8 gig is probably sufficient, but you're going to have log files. You're going to have other configurations. You may want to store a couple of old versions of TrueNAS. When you upgrade TrueNAS, it does not completely overwrite its old version. It uses the snapshot, its native snapshotting functionality, and says, my old boot environment is now a snapshot on the boot disk. So if you boot into the new version, something goes completely sideways, and you just want to go back to the old version, just reboot and select that at the boot prompt. That's all you have to do. USB sticks and SD cards are extremely discouraged and practically undesirable for this purpose. Um, SD cards and USB sticks traditionally have been used because they're very easy, they're very fast, they're very cheap. Um, the reasons to not use them is because they're very cheap. Uh, there, there's no redundancy on USB sticks or SD cards. You can install TrueNAS to multiple USB sticks at once. I've done that. If you have two sticks in the system at the same time, when you install TrueNAS, it will ask you, select the drives you want to install on. If you, if you select both, 
It actually creates a mirror across those USB sticks. The problem is USB sticks and SD cards are not designed for constant writes. So you will smoke the, the little NAND chips on those very quickly. And most USB drives today are just SD cards in a really tiny case. So I would stay away from them. Uh, VMware does no longer allow USB sticks or SD cards on their new installations because of that exact problem. So for your data storage, just avoid it by a cheap SSD or cheap, um, oh, I forget the, the SATA DOM. Uh, you can buy a little disk on module that just plugs into a SATA port on your board. Um, buy one of those, do something you know reliable, stay away from USB and SD cards. And again, I highly recommend a chassis with hot swap drive bays. Uh, there is nothing more infuriating than trying to upgrade your pool by removing the case and then digging around in the drive cage of an internal desktop machine to remove the right drive uh, and then getting the wrong one. Hard drives. So which hard drives should we use? Um, you definitely want to kind of stick for the NAS rated hard drives. The, the reason that you want to stick with NAS rated hard drives is a lot, when you get a lot of hard drives all in one small spot, you have vibration, you have heat, you have other, all kinds of other you know, uh, issues with that. When the disk is actually rotating, it's causing its own vibration. So it's not just outside source vibration, the disk itself can cause vibration. And when you get a ton of those in one spot, it adds up. You, you end up with a, a nice physics problem. So definitely going for NAS rated hard drives. Um, another reason for that is the writing uh, thing that we kind of talked about. When data is written to a desk, a normal, just Western digital blue, you know, generic desktop drive, uh, it doesn't have its own internal write cache. With the NAS disks, they do have an internal write cache and they will report back when the drive has, when the data has been successfully written. With a desktop, it doesn't always do that. It just expects, it's kind of like UDP. The drive gets, the data gets written, it may not respond that everything's been okay. Uh, the write cache allows it to perform properly in a RAID setup. Of course, data center hard drives and SSDs are highly recommended for a pool, and SAS is better than SATA uh, for kind of the same reasons that you want ECC. SAS has native uh, kind of parity checking in the actual uh, process of writing the data across the SAS bus. So it'll make sure that your data is arriving 100% of the time, no questions asked on the other side, where SATA, again, is just kind of like, did it make it? Avoid external USB drives. You can use them. It won't refuse to add a USB drive to a pool, um, but it's not recommended. I personally wouldn't want a dog, cat, child, or my own foot to accidentally kick an external USB drive and unplug one or all of them, and then your pool is completely pooched. So just avoid USB external drives. I have in the past used an external USB drive in the case of an emergency. Uh, just safeguard it. Make sure nobody's going to accidentally unplug it, um, but just avoid them completely uh, for those purposes. Small pro tip, uh, if you do buy the Western Digital Essentials or the Easy Store uh, externals, you can do what's called shucking those, just like an ear of corn. You can re remove the outside case of that drive, take the internal three and a half inch drive and put it into an array, works just fine. Most of the Easy Stores uh, and most of the Essentials are actually a Western Digital Red internally to that little uh, external. So if you find them on sale, Maybe try that. You also want what's called conventional magnetic recording or CMR or PMR, which is perpendicular magnetic recording. Uh, for a split second, I thought about putting the old school uh, Mr. Perpendicular uh, <laughs> animation video that was, that was put out a bunch of years ago. Uh, if you aren't sure what that is, go check it out on YouTube. Uh, I think it was Hitachi that put it out, but just look for... Uh, get perpendicular, and I'm sure the video will come up. Uh, but basically, conventional magnetic recording, all of your bits, all of your, your sectors on the drive are horizontal, and so you, they're all sort of next to each other. With perpendicular, they move those to be actually perpendicular on the drives. So instead of taking up this much space per, per, disc or, uh, per block, they're not taking up this much. So they can squeeze a lot more bits onto that rotational media and just add a ton of storage. 
most of your large, you know, multi-terabyte disks are perpendicular recording. What you want to avoid is the uh, shingled recording, or SMR. Uh, that's where the bits are actually kind of layered on top of one another. Um, that does not play well with RAID arrays, and almost every RAID uh, you, uh, company will not use SMR. So this is not unique to TrueNAS. Nothing in the array, array, RAID array industry wants shingled recording. So some examples of what to buy. Western Digital Red Plus, Red Pros, uh, the Gold Data Center Discs, the Seagate Iron Wolf, Iron Wolf Pro, the Exos, uh, Hitachi, NAS, or their Ultra Stars. Uh, all of those are, are really good options for hard drives. Oh, and of course, SSDs. Um, not all SSDs are created equal. Definitely go with something more of a Pro series than just a generic you know, desktop. Um, they do matter mainly from write cache and stuff like that. Um, for those that aren't aware, most SSDs are actually a mini RAID array in the SSD itself. So if you pull the top off of that SSD, there's little NAND chips scattered throughout the PCBs. Uh, all a SSD is doing is taking the data that comes into the connector and spreading it across those NAND chips. So it's actually a little tiny RAID array in the SSD. Uh, so, of course, spending a little bit more money going with kind of a Pro Series SSD is going to give you a much better quality of SSD than the cheapest thing you could possibly find on Wish.com. Uh, NVMe is better than SAS. SAS is better than SATA. Um, so, obviously, go with whatever fits into your, uh, your budget and needs. And, again, if you can, go with a Pro Series uh, if you want to use, like, the, the Samsung um, Evo drives. So now I've got a tiny bit of time to show you kind of a live tinker uh, with, with TrueNAS. I'm going to hopefully alt-tab out of here and switch over to a uh, live system. So down here on the stage with me, I did bring a TrueNAS Mini. So this is an older TrueNAS Mini. Uh, it's four or five years, something like that. Um, it has four disks in it. Not that camera is probably not going to grab that, uh, but... There are four disks in it. I do have an SSD uh, for a uh, read carry, write cache. And what I want to do is just kind of show you, walk you through firing this thing up, creating a pool, and you can kind of see how all of that works uh, within TrueNAS. So let's do a quick mirror here. Please don't hate on my operating system. <laughs> I'm worse than bringing Windows to a Linux conference. I brought Mac OS. So here is TrueNAS. Uh, this is what it looks like when you first log in. Uh, I've done pretty much nothing else to this machine except set a password and set an IP address. Uh, when you first fire it up and, and log in, you'll see this dashboard. So this is going to give you some system information there uh, on the display. You can see how your CPU is doing, memory. Uh, I do have a, a 10 gig interface in here that's not plugged in, but you can see the 1 gig uh, interface is. That's this IX0. So it just kind of gives you some basic dashboard stats. You know, how are things doing? How are things looking? Um, if you have any kind of an array problem, this little bell icon at the top will have a, a little alert. Sometimes it shakes like it's ringing, uh, just kind of to alert you that you know something is happening with your system that you need to check out. So if you click on that, it brings up the alerts here, and it will tell you you know what's going on and, and um, something you might need to take care of. So I don't want to dive into too many initial basics, like setting IPs and stuff like that. There's tons of guides on the forums on how to set IP addresses, how to configure your network cards, that sort of thing. Um, because of the limited time, I, I want to go right into kind of storage creation uh, with this thing. So let's do that. If we click on storage here on the left side, we're going to click on pools. Uh, of course, there's no pool currently on the unit. If we go down here to disks, we can see the multiple disks. Uh, what I like to do, uh, it's kind of a pro tip, if you expand this little option here, you can hit edit, and you can add a description uh, here. This description that I would set is exactly which drive bay in the system I've put the disk. So you can see the, if we hit cancel, oh, you can see it on that screen too. Um, you can see the serial number of the drive here. Uh, of course, with the, it's easier with the system powered off. 
Uh, so if you make note of these serial numbers and what drive bay you've inserted them into, uh, you can come here, hit edit, and just write in, you know, let's say this is in bay zero, I just put bay zero. Hit save, and now if I go to columns and tell it I want to see the description, now when this drive dies, I know exactly which bay number in my chassis to go to and pull that disk. If you buy the TrueNAS, like the actual commercial TrueNAS appliances, uh, or the newer TrueNAS Mini appliances, uh, they also indicate natively, they know which port is in exactly which slot on the chassis. But when you supply your own hardware, it doesn't know what that is. So doing this will greatly help you narrow down exactly which drive you need to pull uh, out of your chassis so you don't accidentally remove the wrong one. So we've got uh, 12 terabyte drives uh, in here. There's four of them. Uh, we have a one terabyte disk that I have in here just for demo purposes, and then my 120 um, gig drive, which is my, going to be our write cache. So let's go back to pools. And we're going to add a new pool. Create. We're going to give it a name. So you can name this whatever you want. Uh, I tend to prefer just starting with like pool zero and go up. You can name it whatever you like. You can add encryption here if you want. Uh, if your drive, if your pool is going to be really sensitive data and you want encryption at rest on the drives themselves, you can click encryption here, define what encryption type you want, and let it rock and roll. You can also add uh, different VDEV types. So by default, when it fires up, it's a little hard to see. Let me see if I can expand that a little bit. Um, something like that. Hopefully that's visible by everybody out there. Uh, so on the left-hand side, it's showing what the available disks are. On the right-hand side, it's telling you that it's a data VDEV. Uh, so you can add multiple data VDEVs, or you can add another, uh, like an S-log VDEV, so if we click Add VDEV, you can choose Cache, which is the L2 ARC, uh, as it says. You can add a log, which is the S log. Uh, so we're going to do that. And into the data VDEVs, I'm going to select two of these drives. Add those over. I'm going to uh, go back up here and add another data VDEV. I'm going to select the next two 12 terabyte drives. I'm going to add those to this other VDEV down here. And then I'm going to select my 120 gig SSD and I'm going to add it to the um, log VDEV uh, down here. So underneath each VDEV, uh, it lets you choose what type of VDEV you are creating. So this one says mirror and it kind of gives you the estimated raw capacity uh, of that, that specific VDEV. So you can change this if you really want to go stripe, you can. Uh, but you can go mirror. By creating it like this, so we've got two drives per VDEV, there's two VDEVs, this is effectively going to make it a RAID 10. If you want this to be you know, one of those RAID Z types, which we can do for demo purposes, remove everything out of that one VDEV, we're just going to delete the VDEV, and down here it tells you, you know, caution, uh, striping a, a log uh, VDEV can fail if you lose power. Uh, you can add multiple SSDs to your, your ZIL or S log, so that if one fails, it's going to keep, keep mirror. Let's just add these other two to the first VDEV. Now we can select more than stripe or mirror. So now it gives us the options of stripe, mirror, uh, you can go RAID Z1 or RAID Z2. Again, if I choose RAID Z2, it's going to use two of those disks in parity. So our total usable space is going to be about 22 terabytes. Uh, if we go with RAID Z1, it's going to make it 32 terabytes. So this is where the dollar signs and the greed of space, at least for me, comes into play uh, because I start seeing how much space I can have by going with RAID Z1 and I think, is it terrible if I lose all the data? It would be nice to have 32 total terabytes of usable space versus, you know, 22. Um, if I do lose a complete disk out of the system and I don't get to it to, com to upgrade that disk or if another disk fails while it's doing a, the, the resilver and rebuild, I've just lost all of my data. Uh, so take a balance, decide what kind of storage you actually need and what your, your acceptable loss factor is. Uh, if you're just storing media that's backed up someplace else, you could probably go with RAID Z1 if you really wanted to. Uh, but for today's purposes, we're going to be extra safe. We're going to go with RAID Z2.
So we'll have 22 terabytes of space. We've got a 120 gig write uh, cache SSD. And we're going to tell it to ignore the error. Yes, I understand. I know that I could lose all my data because I don't have a second SSD for cache. Write cache. Where I create. As you can see, as many warnings as this goes through, one of the things that I love about TrueNAS is that it is very careful about things that you can do to mess up your data. If you want to remove a disk, if you want to replace a disk, it's very particular about making sure you are absolutely certain that you want to do something. So yes, we're absolutely sure we want to create this pool. Uh, the warning is, is a little small. It says the contents of all added disks will be erased. It will completely erase the drives uh, before it adds them to the pool. It, I mean, it doesn't do a full zeros across the disk, but it will erase all the important bits at the beginning. So we hit create pool. Uh, this will take a, a moment or two for it to, to actually finish. Let's give it a second. Sets up a couple data sets. The system data set that it's talking about setting up here, um, so that's where it's going to keep your logs, it's going to keep your um, graphs that it creates for statistics and performance and stuff like that. All of that kind of gets tossed uh, to the system data set. So here we are, we have our pool, and you can check out um, the pool status by clicking this gear icon at the top and come down to status and that will show you how everything's performing. So we can see that it's a RAID Z2. Uh, we can see the drives that are part of that. All of the disks are online and then we have our write log uh, down here with the SSD and that shows that that is online as well. Little bell icon up here is just telling me that uh, oh, sysleg is not running. Ignore that. So what happens if you actually lose a disk? Uh, well we can simulate that by just pulling one of them. So if we actually just pull a drive, doesn't matter which one, that guy is now out of the system. Uh, within a, a couple of seconds here, the system will figure out, hey, that's missing, and it will give me an alert. So then on here, uh, we will see that the drive, or that the pool is in a state of degraded. Um, sometimes that can take a little while, well, especially if you're not writing data or doing anything to the disks. Uh, there we go. So this tells me the pool is degraded, and if we expand, click on the gear icon, go down to status, we can see exactly which drive uh, was removed. So the, the sort of obnoxious part is it's going to give you the GUID of the disk. It's not going to tell you the serial number of the disk, uh, but we can look at which drives were in the system. So we can see ADA1's there, ADA2 is there, ADA3 is there, there was an ADA0. If we go over to disks under the storage, ADA0 is now missing. So you can kind of line this up and tell, especially if you have the descriptions written down of bay 0, bay 1, bay 2, bay 3, you know exactly which bay is now missing out of your pool and you can tell which disk needs to be replaced. So if we pop this guy back in, Again, within uh, a couple of seconds, it'll figure out that that disk has been inserted. Uh, the alert up here tells us that the state is degraded. It says one or more drives have been removed. Um, and now sufficient replicas uh, exist for the pool to continue functioning. So we have that RAID Z2. So this is telling us the pool is degraded. So your performance will suffer a little bit because one of your drives is missing. However, you still have your data, you're still able to function, you're still able to move forward, everything is cool. Now because no data has changed on the drives, or not enough data has changed for it to matter, and the exact same disk, the exact same serial number was put back into the system, you could see that alert cleared, I don't have to re-silver the drive. So that's kind of helpful if you run into a situation where you just accidentally pulled the wrong drive, you want to put it back in. Most of the time you can reinsert the disk. It's going to figure that out. You're not going to need to re-silver the entire thing. Everything's cool. Uh, especially if you have multiple you know, uh, redundant disks.
If it did need to resilver, uh, you can select it from the pool. So if we go here to status again, uh, where it said that that drive was uh, missing, you can click the three dots and the options are edit, offline, or replace. So you would choose replace, it would ask you which, dr which new disk do you want to use to replace that one that was just removed. You would select it, you hit replace disk, and then it starts that resilver process. Uh, so that's where it would take you know, a couple hours, a couple days, depending on how big your drives are and how much data it actually has to write out. Uh, let's see. I'm pretty much at time. Um, that more or less covers the majority of like at least getting you up and running with TrueNAS. Uh, there are so many other things you can do with this system. You can add NFS shares, you can add iSCSI shares, Samba shares, all sorts of fun stuff with it. Uh, but that does get more than what we have time for today. Uh, but this at least gets you up and running with some understanding of TrueNAS in general uh, and sort of just first steps. So for the last couple of minutes here, uh, are there any questions you guys have on anything you've seen so far? Yes, sir. Very minor. Um, the, the biggest differences are the the type of hypervisor that it's utilizing scales built on Linux versus FreeBSD for core. Uh, there's a bunch of other nuances and utilities and stuff like that that it's running. And uh, there are some performance differences right now. Um, in certain circumstances, scale is actually much faster. In certain circumstances, core is much faster. It really kind of depends on what your needs are for the different systems. Um, if you want something that's just tried and true enterprise storage, I would more still lean on either TrueNAS Core or the commercial TrueNAS products. Uh, if you want to just play around with stuff, go crazy on TrueNAS Scale. It is a pretty amazing piece of software. Any other questions? Yes. So what, um, what kind of electrical and power? Is that kind of bumping it up any by having those shelves and uh, running? Does that uh, add to your bill? Any? The power company loves me. Um, they, they love to bill me every month. So it does. Uh, that's one of my reasonings for kind of preferring the E3 CPUs because they are a little bit lower power. Um, thankfully, those are all SSDs, so they're a little less power hungry than spinning disks. Um, but it, it does utilize a fair amount of power. The, the shelves themselves utilize a, I think without disks, they're somewhere around like 15 to 20 watts. Um, there's a lot of fans, <laughs> so they, they take a decent amount of power. Uh, there's also redundant controllers in in at least the IBM shelf, there's redundant controllers, so those take a little bit of power as well. Um, it's also old hardware, because old hardware is usually stuff that companies throw out for free, right? So I get old stuff from work, um, so it's a little older, it's not as power efficient, so it is a little more power hungry. Uh, my total setup there is probably utilizing someplace close to 800 watts. Then that, that's the entire rack is like 800 watts. The shelf itself is probably around four or 500. Yes, sir. I just wanted to, uh, just wanted to say if anybody's going to shuck drives, uh, be careful that they're not SMR nowadays. Yes. I've gotten a couple that have been uh, particular eight terabytes and four terabytes that have been SMR. Yep. There's a, there's a little bit of a cheat that you can sometimes use with those, the, the essentials uh, disks, especially if the SKU ends in, I want to say it's like EFMZ, uh, most of the time that's a CMR or a PMR disk. Uh, sometimes they'll shove an SMR in there. It just kind of depends on the day, but more often than not, that's, that's the SKU to look for. But yeah, definitely be careful. That can happen. Anybody else? All right. Well, I got the yellow blinky light, so we are right on time. Uh, thanks for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out.